Welcome back. Welcome back. Two weeks ago, as you may know, I spoke to Henry Kissinger about Iraq, Iran and the US elections. Indeed, you may recall that he told me that he's previously only backed eventual losers, though John McCain, who has his support this time, is beginning to look a much better bet. Hope you took his advice. Good tip. We're now going to bring you the second part of this fascinating interview when we looked at US relations with other countries. Do you view China as a potential close ally or uh, arm's length ally? Well, uh, China is not a military threat to the international system. Uh, China is a symbol of the general shift of the center of gravity of world affairs from the Atlantic to the Pacific and to the Indian Ocean. Uh, the major centers of power in the world in the next century, in this century, are going to be located in those regions. Such a shift in the past such as the emergence of Germany at the end of World War uh, of the 19th century, always produced with them enormous tensions. And in the case of the European shift, uh, two world wars. In the present world, uh, there are a number of inhibitions to such an evolution. One is that a war with modern weapons between major countries involves the destruction of a magnitude that really rules out war as a solution of the problem of major countries with e uh, each other. Secondly, there exists now a series of issues in the world that have never existed before that can only be dealt with on a cooperative basis. Environment, climate, energy, uh, these are issues that have no national solutions, no matter how powerful the countries are. So for all of these reasons, I have been arguing uh, that China and the United States should view their relations with each other as cooperative. In terms of cooperative relationships, I mean, do you see a, the relationship you so, wrote a brilliant piece about Putin the other day in Time magazine. Um, do you see him <coughs> as an ally and never a global threat because he's so far away? Russia is in a complex situation. Uh, on the one hand, it has lost 300 years of its history. The western borders of Russia are about where they were under Peter the Great. And that is a tremendous psychological shock to, uh, to Russia. Uh, at the same time, if you look at Russia's demographic situation, with the um, an extraordinarily rapid decline uh, of its population, the rise of proportionately of its Muslim uh, uh, populations, uh, it is hard to conceive of Russia as a global threat, it will be difficult for its neighbors, partly because it finds it difficult to adjust to the reality that many of its current neighbors used to be part of the Russian Empire. Uh, so there will be tensions. But uh, I don't think one should look at Russia as a strategic threat to the West. There is a situation where people t tend to feel that if a, a peace comes between the, the two sides in the Middle East situation, then virtually, as if by magic, all the other problems in the Middle East will be solved. Do you think it's possible to be as optimistic as that? Well, uh, no. And I also don't believe that a peace in the Middle East will appear so magically, uh, we talked earlier about the border issue. But the real issue is how will coexistence be understood? 
by Israel's neighbors? Will it be understood as a step towards the eventual disintegration of the Jewish state? Or will they commit themselves in operational day-to-day -day life to a genuine coexistence such as exists today between European states, where it's not conceivable that any European country would resort to force against a neighbor. Uh, that would be a huge uh, uh, ev evolution. Uh, e even if a peace agreement is reached relatively rapidly, and I'm not as optimistic as uh, the president on it, but assuming it is, I uh, believe it would trigger an assault on it by the radical element in the Muslim world. And they would have, and any peace agreement with, between the parties would need to be defended, at least certainly diplomatically, and uh, against the assaults that will probably come from the radical element. But it would be a significant achievement. It would create a legal basis for to which the various peoples in the region can adjust and it would be it would be a big step forward well listen it's been a joy to talk henry we can't thank you enough pleasure to be with you after months of negotiation it all seemed like the deal was done the former United Nations High Representative and EU Envoy to Bosnia, Paddy Ashdown, had accepted the position of sort of super envoy to Afghanistan. And the Afghan president was willing, even eager, uh, to accept him. But last week something went awry and uh, Lord Ashdown lost the support he needed to do the job when Afghanistan made it clear that they didn't want him anymore. So what went wrong? What's the explanation? What went wrong? Uh, very simply, D David, what went wrong was that uh, President Karzai and the Afghan government changed their mind. I mean, look, I, I made it clear from the very start when Condi Rice's office first approached me in October that I could only ever do this with the support of the international community, support of the Afghan government. Uh, I think President Karzai was probably consulted by the Americans late October, early November. Um, certainly by the end of November when we'd agreed the mandate. Um, I went out to see President Karzai on, I think, the 11th of December. By that stage, I went to see him because we wanted to double-check that the two of us could get on. At the end of that meeting, um, we agreed we could work together. Uh, and then I went to see Ban Ki-moon, who offered me the job. I said, look, only if President Karzai agrees. He said he did. I rang President Karzai straight after that meeting. He said he wanted me to, to work with him. So all the way through, it all looked good the, Afghanistan, the Afghanistan government, sovereign government of Afghanistan, agreed the mandate. It's not like Bosnia. Quite inappropriate to have those powers. I wouldn't have asked for them, and I wouldn't have accepted them if they had. It was to coordinate the international community to support the government of Afghanistan. All the way through, they said yes. And then right at the very end, just as they were going to Davos, uh, when Condi Rice was finally going to see Karzai, um, the, uh, the thing turned. And I could tell it had turned, because I was watching the uh, newspapers being published in Afghanistan, and above all, the uh, government-controlled newspapers. Uh, why? Well, I think we can speculate about why. But, but do you think it was the thought that you, were, you could have taken power away from from the president that's part of it, or that fear? Well, people say that. I mean, my, I, I'm very clear that this was to do with internal Pashtun politics. You know, this is still desperately needed. We need to coordinate the uh, operations in Afghanistan, and we need somebody who'll do that, not to govern Afghanistan, but to make sure the international community acts with a single act, a single voice, to support President Karzai and his but, government. Because at the moment, would you say you, you talked at, at one stage about losing in Afghanistan. I mean, would you say, if you take the last year in Afghanistan, yeah, we're, losing. Uh, we're losing, aren't yeah. we? We're losing ground and we're losing. Yeah. I mean, uh, that isn't to say it is inevitable that we will lose. It isn't to say it is irrecoverable, but the momentum is moving away from us. A postscript, Paddy, if we may, about Serbia. This Sunday, the Serbian elections and so on, and uh, Mr. Nikolic is uh, tipped to possibly win. Um, now, do you think an announcement next week from Kosovo 
of its independence is inevitable? Yes, I do. I mean, I think two things. First of all, I don't think it's inevitable that Nikolic will win. I think that Tadic will probably win. Uh, but the second is that, you know, when the Serbs, great nation of Serbs, and they are admirable, powerful, tough, and very gifted, when they decide to lock themselves in a dark room uh, and not let the world in, uh, then there's nothing you can do to stop that. If they really want to go with Nikolic, they are removing themselves from the only future they can have in Europe. Third thing, which is inevitable, Kosovo will declare independence, uh, and then we have to see what happens next. And is, and is it... Um possible that the reaction under Nikolic or something would be so extreme that this situation could descend into violence again? Well, Surely not, one hopes, but I mean, is it possible? It, listen, at the range, at the ultimate range of possibility, it's possible. But would the Serbian army take on NATO? I don't think so. Would there be groups of people who might try to create chaos in the southern part of Serbia, the northern part of Kosovo? Possible, but I don't think it would last for long. I think the consequences of this are more likely to be political. I guess there would be a bid, which we should reject out of hand, for Republika Srpska to break away from Bosnia. That would really be the, the beginning of a, of, of, of a much wider and much more dangerous problem. But my guess is that there isn't really very much Belgrade can do. I think sensible voices in Belgrade, including quite high up, though they won't admit it, have accepted that Kosovo was lost some time ago. You know, David, there is a, there's a sort of fact of history, which is when a nation governs a part of it in which it's a minority in such a bad way, the consequence often is that they lose the moral and practical right to govern that part. And the truth is that this is the last debt to be paid for the tragedy of the Milosevic years. They soaked Kosovo in blood. They governed it outrageously on the basis that only 5% of Kosovo was Serbs and 95 is Albanians. The bottom line fact, and it ought to have been recognized long before now by the international community is that Belgrade has lost the moral and practical uh, right to govern Kosovo and now we need to make a reality of that. I don't find it easy, it sets up uncomfortable precedents, but there's no other way to go. Thank you very much Thank indeed very much. to Paddy Ashdown. That's about all we've got time for this week in Frost Over the World. So do join us again, please, if you would, in seven days' time. Until then, top of the day, goodbye for now.